How are we looking? Uh, there we go. We can see it. All right. All right. We ready to go? Yeah, take it away, buddy. Floor is yours. All right. Well, I uh, thank you, everybody, for getting up early on a Saturday morning and uh, joining us. As uh, Mike and Kevin has mentioned, uh, it's really a, it's an honor to be asked to present uh, with such a great group of professionals. Um, you know, I truly believe that you can't beat the amount of information that you'll get between today and tomorrow with all the speakers uh, for a relatively small amount of money and from the comfort of your own home and at your own convenience. So, but I appreciate you joining me and Kevin, thank you for uh, all your hard work setting this up and getting it together. And um, I know it's a ton of work and a lot of us behind the scenes time in. So, but what I'm going to talk about today is uh, integrating force plates into your practice. Okay, the use of force plates, uh, precision data collection easily turned actionable. So, first off, I wanted to say thanks to a few folks. Okay, uh, Mike Boyle, uh, Bob Hansen, his wife Diane and Carrie uh, for putting up for me, with me for the last 13 years at Body by Boyle. Uh, all their support and having me in to speak. Kevin Carr, as I mentioned, um, he, uh, as I mentioned, he's put in a ton of work putting this thing together. You don't, I, I never really quite understood it until I've seen behind the scenes how much time he's put into this. So a uh, big thank you to him and my fellow presenters, uh, some of whom I've never met before. Uh, it's one of the drawbacks of the virtual, uh, the virtual uh, method of presenting. But um, but some of whom I've met you know well in the past, and as I mentioned, I'm honored to be presenting alongside them. And all of you uh, for spending your time with us. Uh, I hope you find my presentation useful. Uh, force plates, they've been used for quite a while, uh, particularly in strength and conditioning and biomechanics labs. Um, but as any technology, uh, as the years have gone by, they've gotten simpler and less expensive and easier to use and have started making their way out into you know, general practice, uh, primarily in the strength and conditioning field. <clears throat> and then uh, thanks to my children who are sitting upstairs and uh, hopefully are gonna be quiet and not come bother me. I have an 11 year old, a nine year old and a six year old and I have no babysitter today. So I'm hoping they don't bug me, but if they do, I apologize. <laughs> so. Uh, again, my name is John Paloff. I'm a physical therapist. Uh, I'm a board certified orthopedic specialist via the APTA, and I'm also a certified orthopedic manual therapist uh, via Maitland uh, Australian Physiotherapy, uh, which is a series of about, I don't know, about 100 hours of continuing education uh, with a pretty rigorous two-day uh, exam afterwards, uh, which includes a practical. I actually, in all honesty, think it's far better than the APTA's uh, board exam, but but, uh, but those are my alphabet soups. Uh, I graduated from the University of Connecticut in 1997. I'm presently practicing at Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning in Woburn, Mass, which is uh, just outside of Boston. And I also practice at Edge Performance Systems in Northboro, Mass at the New England Baseball Center, along with Brian McDonough. Uh, I've worked in a strength and conditioning setting for many, many years, uh, in all honesty. It's played a much larger role in shaping how I work with clients uh, than the physical therapy continuing ed that I've come across. Um, you know, I've been very, very fortunate to work with a number of very bright strength coaches uh, and other individuals over the years. You know, I started out in 2001 at a College of the Holy Cross with Coach Jeff Oliver. He was kind enough to let me sit in and observe and eventually intern and then eventually train some athletes there. Um, I worked with Eric Cressy and his crew uh, when they first started out back in, God, I don't know when, maybe 2007 it was, maybe a little later. Um, and then, as I mentioned, I've been at Coach Boyles for about 13 years now. And then I've also worked at Edge Performance Systems with Brian McDonough here south of the city uh, of Boston uh, for probably the past, you know, I don't know, five, six, seven years. So I've been very, very fortunate to spend a lot of time with some very bright people uh, who've really played a big role in shaping how I approach rehab and training. <clears throat> I've also worked for the AHL Worcester Sharks, uh, the San Jose Sharks for several years when uh, the Worcester Sharks were here in Worcester, they're no longer here, but 
probably about five or six years working with the teams there, uh, which I really enjoyed. And again, learned a ton, particularly from Mike Potenza, their head strength coach. And then, uh, and I actually, unlike a lot of PTs, I, I actually pride myself in the fact that I've trained or trained some folks, uh, meaning, you know, writing programming and being out on the floor, evaluating progress and adjusting on the fly. Um, you know, prior to Mike working with the Red Sox, I ran the baseball group at Mike Boyle's because uh, Boston is not necessarily a hotbed <laughs> for baseball. And uh, Boyle's was traditionally known as a hockey place, um, but has since changed. And, uh, and I've worked a lot with re training rehabbing athletes um, in the early phases of transitioning from rehab to strength and conditioning. Uh, oftentimes, it was just easier to write out programming for them, understanding what their do's and don'ts were. So. Uh, I found that this has benefited me tremendously in that, uh, number one, I understood or understand the demands of the collegiate or professional or amateur athletes and what they need to go through day in and day out, year in and year out to prep themselves. Uh, and also if I'm working with clients uh, who are working with a coach, uh, it's greatly beneficial to me to be able to talk the talk, so to speak, uh, and understand what the coaches are doing on the floor so that I can communicate effectively with them uh, regarding their client's injury uh, or, or surgery or whatever it might be. So that that way, uh, everybody makes out the athlete can continue to train or the client can continue to train and you know obtain training uh, effects. Uh, the coach can continue to work with their client. And then uh, the, you know, the coach makes my job easy in that I don't need to worry about what they're doing exercise wise. I particularly stick to the rehab side of things manual therapy, uh, educating the, uh, the client as to where they're at. And uh, it really is a, is a nice relationship that everybody benefits from. So, and I'm also a part-time fitness model. <laughs> <laughs> um, so today we're gonna cover a few topics. Okay, what are force plates exactly? What can they do and what can't they do? Uses or applications for force plates in practice. Okay, which tests am I using? Uh, there's a, a number of tests that you can use. I've chosen two that I've been focusing on recently, but but there, you know, once you understand the the technology, there's really a ton of things you could do with them. Uh, which metrics and data do I look at? And generally, was it what is it indicative of? And we're gonna go through some good case studies. Uh, this is what's really gotten me excited about things, is because I have a steady flow of patients or clients or athletes of all different sorts, sizes, sports, ages, uh, levels. And I've been getting quite a bit of data as it's pretty easy to get data. And as I've gone through it, uh, really found some very interesting trends and findings and uh, has kind of really given me more questions than answers uh, that I'm currently working to kind of figure out. So uh, what are force plates? Essentially what force plates are is the way to, a convenient way of thinking about them is they're, they're like very precise scales. Okay, there's two of them. There's one that your left foot will rest on and one that your right foot will rest on. And they measure force in real time. Okay, so instead of weight, kilograms or pounds, uh, you know, they choose a different metric, which is Newtons. Okay, but essentially it's the same thing. And in these scales, essentially they measure in real time Okay, with time stamping, okay, like much like a video, uh, with very high sampling rates, meaning many, many, many measurements of force per unit of time. I, the sampling rate with the Hawken force force plates that I use are at a at a thousand hertz. Again, it measures in newtons, not pounds. It uses factual things like gravity, ground reaction forces, physics, and math. You know, the anti insta stuff, as I like to call it. Uh, the Insta stuff is referring to all the garbage that's on uh, Instagram that uh, I would consider pseudoscience or just look at me uh, videos. So um, they give little to no feedback. So there's very little give to them. Uh, the idea being is they're trying to replicate pushing off of a solid surface uh, or almost solid surface. So there's no real give to them. So they don't give the athlete any any feedback, number one. And number two, uh, it doesn't affect the data collection. And as I mentioned before, in the not so distant past, uh, you know, force plates were very complex and kind of onerous uh, devices that would spit out useless mountains of data. Um, 
but uh, that essentially you needed a data scientist to translate for you in order to turn it into something actionable. And at that point, it's useless. Uh, however, you know, it's really evolved pretty quickly uh, into easily collectible and actionable data that is really, really valuable. Uh, valuable in the rehab setting uh, as far as gauging an athlete's progress uh, and assessing where they need to focus their, their, their efforts to. Uh, and then in the strength and conditioning setting as well, uh, almost as a vital sign, which we'll talk about in a little bit more depth in a minute here, but essentially assessing where that athlete is at that time and day physically. Uh, and what I mean by that is, is uh, you know, they may, it may be a college athlete and they may have gotten a great night's sleep, or they may be in the middle of finals where they're staying up until two or three in the morning studying, or it could be a weekend when they're out drinking. So. Um, so there's a, there's a way of using that to assess where they're at functionally, which we'll get to in a minute here. So uh, what can plates do? <clears throat> As I mentioned, it measures forces throughout the various phases of, of a given movement. And by a given movement, I mean it could be a two-legged counter movement jump, uh, hands-free or with hands, meaning hands on the hips, or you allow the athlete to use their hands. It could be a single-leg counter movement jump, it can be an isometric hamstring strength test. It can be something as simple as a squat. Uh, I, I had a total knee patient who was 65, who probably, I don't know, two months and three months into her, her rehab, you know, I had her hop on, um, hop on the force plates and bang out some, some hands on hip squats just to see what came up. And it was really fascinating, you know, the diff how much she was favoring uh, this, the operative side. Uh, and how much force she was able to produce in the, the various phases of the movement. So uh, it's really, it's really kind of up to your imagination and understanding of the basics of the math and the physics to figure out what you want to do with them. As I mentioned, it could be two-legged, it, it could be single-legged. You can measure, measure force production and strength movements, isometrics. Uh, you know, examples would be a mid-thigh pull, an isometric mid-thigh pull, or an isometric split squat is something I've used or even a single leg squat. Uh, and then the plates, the beauty here is with the Hawken Dynamics uh, force plate system, uh, you know, really where the rubber hits the road is the data analysis. Um, you know, their particular software platform or cloud-based platform, you know, they're able to formulate over 30 different metrics. You can generate comparisons between tests uh, by date, uh, by limbs, uh, seasonable comparison. You know, a lot of folks in the strength and conditioning field will get their baseline measurements, you know, in the, you know, immediate preseason prior to the competitive season, because, you know, conceptually, that's when the athlete should be, you know, in peak condition, ready for competition. Uh, and then you can, you know, generate testing from various points during the year, mid-season, uh, pre-competition, uh, early off-season. Uh, and the beauty of it is, is you can do it all from your laptop, a tablet, you know, you don't, you don't need Watson, the supercomputer anymore. You can access the data very easily and you can share the data very easily as well, which is great. Uh, as I mentioned, um, you know, I have experience with two particular brands of the force plates. Um, so, you know, I haven't been doing it for decades, but over the last couple of years, I've been kind of increasingly utilizing them. And uh, I've kind of settled upon the Hawken Dynamics force plates as far and away the, the, the best out there, um, you know, for several reasons. Number one, they're a local company. They're from Portland, Maine. Um, number two, uh, they're very, very accessible. Uh, any questions you have with these folks, um, you can text them, you can call them, you can email them, and they will get right back to you. And if there's any problems, they'll help you resolve them as opposed to uh, uh, the other company that I had dealt with, which uh, the communication is lacking. Um, the Hawken in particular, uh, very easy to set up. They're ready to go in about 60 seconds. Okay. You, they're, they're wireless and they're cordless. So you connect to the left and the right unit, and then you hit the on button and then you sync your tablet with it and you're ready to go. You're ready to start testing. As I mentioned, you know, wireless data collection via the tablet and direct Wi-Fi. So you can actually be on the field. You can be on a soccer field. You can be on a football field. And as long as you have your tablet, the, the force plates utilize direct Wi-Fi. So you can collect your data and then upload it when you actually have a Wi-Fi connection 
uh, to the internet. And as I mentioned, it uses rechargeable lithium batteries. So you can use them anywhere and the, and the, the charges last for hours. They're very reliable. It captures appropriate data every time. The issue I had with the competing brand was oftentimes you do a test and it would say faulty trial, faulty trial, faulty trial. And at that point, the athlete starts to get tired and also just makes it difficult to utilize. Uh, as I mentioned, unbeatable customer support and communication. Ben Watson is their, um, is their CEO slash inventor slash resident meathead. Uh, he's actually not a meathead, but he, he's a very well-trained guy. It's one of the things I love about them up there is, is they actually work out and they tinker with the force plates and they, they're, they're in the trenches, so to speak, not to use an over, overused cliche. But uh, and as I mentioned, anytime there's issues, they're right there. Uh, you don't have to wait. Very sound testing protocols. Um, they use single jumps, uh, repeat single jumps versus repeated jumps. Uh, the competing brand that I'd used in the past was using a three jump protocol, which if you're doing a single leg, hands-free counter movement jump, and you're standing on a force platform, it gets harder and harder on jumps two and three to replicate that jump. Um, and oftentimes your data becomes skewed because of execution errors. Um, Scientifically sound metrics. Again, this may be surprising. Um, Hawken utilizes actual jump height, uh, for instance, when they're calculating things, which is a function of what the athlete's velocity is, the instant that their foot leaves the plate, and their body weight in newtons, and then the fact that gravity is constant. Uh, so it gives you a very real and accurate jump height number. Uh, versus uh, a competing brand that utilizes flight time, uh, which in my mind, I'm not going to pay 20 grand for an expensive just jump mat. I'll buy the just jump mat and get the same data from it. Um, so, and all their, their metrics are based on very, you know, tried and true math concepts, math and physics, math and physics. So it makes the data very useful and actionable. And as I mentioned, uh, very, very affordable. Uh, the hardware itself, um, you know, is, is, I believe, you know, somewhere in the, you know, a couple thousand dollars, six, $7,000. Um, and then there's also a yearly subscription fee for the app, uh, for data collection and data an and analytics. Um, but again, the price has come down substantially compared to what it's been in the past and actually very exciting. Uh, Hawk and dynamics was nice enough to offer a pretty substantial discount. If you are listening to this uh, presentation, um, you know, uh, the next slide, I believe it is, there's a website you can go to uh, to get more information and you'll also get a 20% discount on the software and the hardware. So as I mentioned, Portland, Maine, okay, home of great beer and great food. As I mentioned also, they actually train and test. So, um, you know, they understand what we're doing in the gym and in the rehab setting. And there it is. So that's your winter seminar discount code. Okay. Uh, I believe that should be in the handout. That's www.hawkandynamics.com forward slash MBSC 2021. Okay. And that'll, that'll give you a 20% off discount. Uh, and again, if you want, you know, they're, they'll, what they'll do is they'll set up an online demo for you. If you like, uh, if you're local, they'll come to your place and uh, you know, Ben Watson, Drake Barabit, are uh, are very accessible and they'll they'll be willing to any you know answer any questions you might have and walk you through what these things do. So, whoop, how did that get in there? I don't know. So applications in the strength and conditioning setting. Okay, uh, very useful for baseline testing. All right, you know how strong are they and can they produce force? Okay, not necessarily relative to time. Okay, which would be power. Uh, are they powerful? meaning can they express force quickly? Okay, you can be very strong, but not very neuromuscular efficient and you know, maybe not have the same power numbers, okay? And then also, are they springy? Um, you know, it's not necessarily a scientific term, uh, but you know it when you see it. And what you'll see in the data as you dig in a little bit, there's some metrics uh, called uh, you know, propulsive net impulse and braking net impulse. And these are the people who are springy. Uh, do, can they produce big impulses of force, both in the braking and the propulsive phases? Um, how strong are their brakes? 
okay? How much power and force do they produce during the braking phase of movements? A uh, little aside there, I, we don't refer to it as the eccentric phase uh, because that may not necessarily be accurate. Uh, all the muscles that are working during the downward phase of counter movement jump may not be working uh, eccentrically. Uh, you can't say that with certainty. A more accurate uh, descriptor, uh, and it sounds silly, but the semantics matter, uh, is the braking phase because your mass is moving towards the earth and you have to apply force in order to slow it down and eventually reverse it into propulsion. Um, propulsive force and power, okay, is another thing that you can look at in baseline testing. Uh, and then you can look at ratios of propulsion to braking, okay? Uh, as I've gone through the data with injured and healthy athletes, I've been able to make some, um, some kind of assumptions about uh, what certain ratios should look like, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and it corresponds with uh, the way certain athletes move. Uh, and then the, the thing in the rehab setting, especially that I find extremely valuable, is are there asymmetries from leg to leg? Uh, both in two leg and single leg movements. Okay, this, this is really where the rubber hits the road for me, uh, being a physical therapist primarily. So, um, applications in the strength and conditioning setting, again, uh, you, you can use it to measuring, measure progress. Okay, are there metrics improving in response to the training stimulus? I think most of us, if we spent enough time on the floor, can eyeball it. And you could probably make some assumptions that are pretty accurate, um, but this is really like using a laser uh, as far as getting real hard, actionable, reproducible data to say, yes, their metrics are improving, whether it be their braking power, whether it be their you know, net braking impulse uh, or their propulsive power or their propulsive force. Uh, you can utilize it to make sure that they're responding to what you're doing. Or if they feel like they're hitting plateaus or their numbers are plateauing, you know, you can utilize this to correlate that. Uh, again, uh, I think the most accurate way of kind of characterizing this is you can track the vital signs. You know, where are they on a day-to-day -day basis? If you're working with uh, collegiate or professional athletes um, or even, you know, adult clients, you know, where are they on a day-to-day -day basis? Especially nowadays, for example, like if somebody's coming out of, uh, you know, maybe they got COVID. Uh, if they've gotten COVID and they're clear to return to working out, what do their numbers look like and where are they compared to where they were pre-sickness? Uh, or uh, as I mentioned, if it's a collegiate athlete and they're approaching a competition day, let's say they play football on a Saturday, you know, ideally you want them peaking on a Friday or a Friday morning. So they should be at or maybe even above their peak, you know, propulsive force numbers leading into that. And that will give you feedback to know that yes, your preparation leading into the, you know, the day of the game is 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 working, or maybe there's some things that you need to change, or maybe they're they're missing some things in their preparation and their recovery. Uh, it can be predictive of injury risk. Um, there's some really smart people out there. Uh, you know, Tom Newman is a guy at Yale who has been very helpful to me uh, as far as sharing some observations he's had. Uh, with, you know, if their peak propulsive power or their uh, average propulsive force or braking force numbers drop below, below certain levels uh, relative to their baseline numbers uh, that they obtained preseason, the risk of hamstrings and hip flexors and groins increases substantially. So, uh, so it can be predictive of injury risk. As I mentioned, you know, are they peaking pre-competition? That's an important one. Okay. And then on the fly training adjustments, you know, if you combine this with workload measures, uh, you know, meaning, you know, uh, you know, yardages or maybe workloads that you're calculating based off of your volumes, you know, do you need to turn the dial up or dial down depending on how they're testing out? And then, you know, the other thing that you can work on as well is what qualities specifically need work. You know, is it the brakes? Is it propulsive work? Uh, you know, impulse production, things like this, and you can you can make some alterations in your training based on what you're finding. So, applications in the rehab setting, uh, this is where you know tremendous value. Uh, you know, do they check all? The, first off, I look to make sure they're checking all the boxes that are pertinent in the strength and conditioning setting. Uh, if an athlete is rehabbing from an ACL surgery, um, you know, great, they have full range of motion, they're not swollen, they have some good thigh bulk, whatever it might be. Um, but are they back to being athletic? So instead of looking at them through the lens of a rehabbing athlete, 
uh, look at them through the lens of a strength and conditioning setting and be like, okay, are their power numbers, their break numbers, and their propulsive force numbers where they're supposed to be? Are they generally strong and powerful and balanced? Okay, that, that's, a, a, that's a must have if you're looking at return to sport. Are there imbalances or deficits from side to side? Uh, this is interesting and we'll look at a bunch of these in our case studies. Um, you know, usually there are and they last a heck of a lot longer than I, than I had anticipated. So uh, again, this is where it's really useful to me in judging are they close enough and ready to get back to, to, to the pitch. You know, how substantial are said deficits? Are they at risk of re-injury? Again, great for quantification, okay? Uh, another way that I'm looking at things, particularly in ACLRs, is, uh, you know, is one surgical approach better than another? Um, you know, I've always thought that the patellar tendon graft is the gold standard, uh, and I, the patellar tendon autograft, I should say, meaning from your own body. Uh, and I still think it probably is, um, but there are some deficits that you see for the first year, maybe year and a half or even two, uh, that maybe, you know, could be avoided with a bone tendon bone al uh, allograft, uh, meaning cadaver graft, you know, uh, and then hamstring grafts also have their, their issues as well. So for me, it's been interesting because it's really given me some, some insights that I may not have picked up on otherwise. Uh, comparison post-injury to baseline, if you have it. Okay, again, if you're in a collegiate setting, you should have baseline numbers. If somebody gets hurt, you can, you know, when they're returning to sport or progressing through their rehab, you can see where they're at relative to their pre-injury baseline. Okay, and documenting progress. Okay, instead of using manual muscle testing and all this other garbage, uh, you know, you can actually have real hard numbers that show a linear pro progress or, you know, uh, I should say, uh, you know, uh, calendar-based progress. Okay, and it also simplifies interdisciplinary communication. Um, I do work, some of my patients are athletes and they work with teams and a number of teams out there now do have force plate testing. Uh, you know, generally as an anecdotal observation, I've noticed that uh, the strength and conditioning settings uh, tend to precede the physical therapy settings by five to 10 years uh, in progress. Uh, a lot of these guys have been using force plates for a long, long time. And uh, it's great because I can be rehabbing somebody at boils and get them on the plates, get some data and send it to their team. And their strength coach can see exactly where they're at with progress and uh, what their deficits are or you know how, how much progress they've made. Early observations for me, again, I've been using these for approximately, I don't know, uh, a couple of years now, but really in depth for the past probably six months. Uh, you know, data is consistent and accurate. It's very reproducible, okay? It's not prone to wild vacillations, okay? And it's much, much more functional data than existing means of quantification. Okay, in PT, you know, the PT school, they teach you manual muscle testing, which is basically, you know, using your hands to push on people. Uh, it's, it's really useless and it's a joke. Uh, it's embarrassing, actually. Uh, and in the athletic population, it's completely useless. Uh, when I worked in a traditional... Uh, clinic setting, you know, I used to, you used to have to kind of just make up numbers to feed insurance companies BS. So they would keep approving visits, you know, okay, they've gone from a four minus to a four plus, you know, or they've gone from a four plus to a five, you know, so, but you never said the five because you don't want them to cut you off. So, but useless, completely useless. Isokinetic testing in the PT world is looked at as the gold standard. Uh, I'm not quite sure how this has happened. Uh, isokinetic was a thing in the 80s. Uh, in the early 90s, uh, you know, there were machines that they used to use both for rehab and testing, uh, workman's comp, and then eventually a lot of people were stuck with large, expensive, useless pieces of equipment. Um, you know, they're, they're okay. It's better than testing nothing. And you can make some inferences based on isokinetic testing results as to how they will carry over. And clearly there's some connection to you know, at least compare, comparing side to side when you're trying to look out predictively on re-injury risk. But again, it's limited. Uh, it's isolated muscle testing. Uh, it's not, not exactly functional and it doesn't really measure anything with, it doesn't assess where they're at with their central nervous system, neuromuscular coordination, breaking. It doesn't give you very clear data functionally. Um, so, and then isometric testing is also a thing, uh, you know, of isolated muscles. Again, I guess it's better than nothing, um, but it's very prone to, uh, to operator error. It's prone to, uh, 
you know, the athlete's motivational levels. And again, it doesn't necessarily give you a, a, a real accurate reading of where they're at functionally. Uh, oh, and one thing worth mentioning as well is that none of those, and this is a, uh, another kind of problem that I see with return to sport testing that's used in the rehab setting, is that there, there's no uh, performance testing. There's no testing uh, to see if they're fit. There's no testing to see if they're really all that explosive. Uh, there are some things that we will utilize, but again, it's not very pertinent, I don't think. And there's not very good strength testing. So, so it's not, there's not a whole lot of data to go off of to see if they're gonna go back at a high performance level. Uh, you know, early on, uh, what I've seen is these measurements pretty much match up with athleticism. Uh, peak power levels, the more peak power you produce, guess what? The faster and more powerful the athlete is and the better they move, okay? I've yet to come across somebody that produces big power numbers and moves like crap. Um, big engines and brakes, uh, specifically looking at average propulsive force and um, average braking force produced. Uh, you want both. Uh, some athletes will skew in one direction versus the other. Um, generally, the propulsive force numbers are larger, uh, which is the way it should be. Um, but the even better athletes, as long as they have high propulsive numbers, uh, the closer their braking numbers are to those propulsive numbers, generally the better they move. Um, and then again, your explosive and good athletes are very twitchy. Uh, they're very good at impulse generation, both propulsive and braking. Uh, and this is probably a measure of, of ner nervous system function. Um, but they are just, they produce big, big impulses, meaning they can produce big amounts of force uh, with very little range of motion. You've seen people, if you see people with big vertical jumps, they're not, they're not generate, they're not using big uh, vertical displacements in the counter movement part. It's usually a little dip and then they produce a huge amount of force going upwards in a very small amount of range of motion. Uh, and again, you can, you can capture this with your, um, with your uh, metrics with your net propulsive impulse and your net braking impulse. Uh, another very, very interesting one that I've come across and has kind of made me rethink things uh, is that past injuries may be pain-free. They may look like they're quote unquote rehabbed. They don't bother them, they don't notice it. Um, but what I'm seeing on, the, on the, the plate data is that they still manifest in side to side deficits in certain metrics. And in some, it lingers for years or even decades. And these are people who are well-trained or very active. Uh, and again, clinically, their, their knees look good, uh, but they're, they're showing up with some very interesting side-to-side -side deficits, which we'll talk about in a, case, a couple of case studies here. Uh, and then certain sports, you know, the unilateral dominant sports will present with substantial side-to-side -side deficits. Hockey, baseball uh, are two that I see. Uh, and um, you know, you'll know you see some deficits that are fairly normal there uh, versus other sports, uh, even soccer, uh, plant leg versus ball striking leg, dominant leg. So, so that's something I've also noticed. Um, so which tests am I using? Uh, the two-legged counter movement jump is one that I'm using. Um, Essentially, it's a, it's a, you're standing quietly on the plates, your hands are on your hips, you're not using the arms to generate any vertical force. It's straight lower body power uh, and, and force. So you start standing still, your hands are on your hips. Again, that gives a true assessment of lower extremity function. Uh, I've had a couple people jump with their arms and it increases your power production, your propulsive force by, gosh, I'd say somewhere on the order of 30 to 40 percent maybe. Um, so that can really muddy the waters when you're looking at trying to get straight lower extremity numbers. Uh, the braking phase, okay, as I mentioned, is the downward phase of the movement, okay? It's not eccentric necessarily, okay? So important semantics. Uh, the point of lowest displacement is exactly what it sounds like. Essentially, these force plates are looking at your center of mass. They're not looking at the athlete. Um, so what they will, what they will uh, quantify is the bottom of the movement, okay? So at the, move, the point where they're done decelerating and they start to reverse and go upwards, okay? That's referred to as the point of lowest displacement. And then there's obviously the propulsive phase, which is the upwards phase, and then there's landing, okay? And the way I execute this to try and minimize bias uh, or a learned skill 
is I don't really coach it a whole heck of a lot. So I have a protocol that, you know, I call the Pala protocol um, that basically I have them practice on solid ground. I have them do two or three practice reps pre-test. I'll have them do the two-legged counter movement jump, practice it twice, get on the plates, do three, uh, two or three uh, reps, and then I have them get off. Uh, let's say we start with the right, I'll have them do two or three on the right, test the right, and then same thing on the left. Okay, that way I eliminate um, you know, I don't want them learning or just getting a practice jump while they're, while we're collecting data. So this way they, they have it in their mind. And the thing that I find interesting is even for really good athletes, the single leg counter movement jump with the hands on the hip is actually pretty hard to execute. So, um, so it, it serves you well to have them do a practice rep or two pre-test. Okay. So let's see if I can do this. And here's an example of it right here. Okay. The tone goes jump land okay and, and that's the tablet okay that comes with your your force plates it registers your data you hit save and boom you're ready to test okay it really is super super simple okay you can test a whole team in probably five minutes okay very very simple and the unique feature of this actually is is that some some of the folks up uh, up in portland you know, they toy around with it. They're actually using the tablet on a stand um, as a, a, a real-time feedback mechanism. So uh, there's there's various ways you can use it. I'm using it for data collection. You could actually use it in your training as a biofeedback mechanism. Okay, so that's the double leg. And then as you might imagine, the single leg counter movement jump is very similar, okay? Um, you know, start standing still, hands on the hips, braking phase, lowest displacement, propulsive phase, landing. Again, with the two-legged and the single leg, I don't really use these numbers as much uh, because I don't think they're going to be as valid uh, because when you watch athletes land, uh, they'll land in different manners. Some of them will just land straight-legged. Uh, some of them will make soft landings. Uh, you know, so again, the, I don't. I don't think there's really strong inferences I can I can draw from it. If you're, if I was going to try and get more actionable data with landing, I may do like a drop jump where they step off of a 12-inch box, land on the plates, and then jump again. So maybe that way you're accentuating your landing forces, uh, or in that case, it would be braking forces. And again, I do two two reps on each leg. Practice reps first. And again, it's hard with the hands on the hips, so have them practice. Okay, the metrics I'm looking at, okay, there's tons of useful ones, but you can kind of get, you know, lost looking at all these things. I look at force production, so average braking and propulsive force. Okay, peak power output, okay. Primarily in the propulsive phase, but you could also look at the braking phase, and that's measured in watts. And again, it's a good measure of athleticism. Average propulsive and braking velocities, which is exactly what it sounds like, okay, which we'll get to in our case studies here. Net braking and propulsive impulses. This is in newtons times seconds, okay? How twitchy are these guys or girls? Propulsive to braking net impulse ratio. Again, this kind of, you know, your more powerful and agile athletes tend to have lower impulse ratios. Uh, as long as that, that top number, that propulsive number is a big number, okay? Jump height is one I'll look at. Displacement depth, are they using a different strategy from one side to the other? Are they using a knee dominant strategy on one versus a hip dominant? And then force at lowest displacement is another one I look at. So at the bottom of the movement, how much force are they producing? Okay. So again, here's your uh, a nice little kind of uh, animation of your metric, okay? So that's standing still, and then it's progressively going down and then take off, okay, and then moving across, landing, and then stopping. Let me hit that one one more time for you guys. Okay, but we're going to get to some nice nice uh, graphics here in a second. Okay, and this is what the, what the trace looks like. Okay, so this is a, a typical trace. Well, maybe not really a typical trace because it's, these are probably the highest numbers I've gotten yet. But essentially what you're looking at here is, you know, starting on the left and moving to the right. As I mentioned before, there's a timestamp, okay? The yellow is the unweighting phase. Now remember, the easy way to think about this is, is that um, you're standing on scales that measure in Newtons. So as you start to descend into your jump, it's actually going to measure less force. 
an easier uh, analogy, okay, to, to think about this in terms of is, is, you know, think about if they were standing on your face, okay? When they went to descend into the jump, you know, the perceived force on your face would be less. But then as they approach the bottom of the jump, okay, and start to reaccelerate into propulsion, the face would get mashed because now more force would be going through the face. And then as they reach, as they almost get to the point where they're gonna propel and the foot's gonna leave the, the plate, there'll be a rapid drop off in force through the face until there's no force on the face once they leave your face, okay? So the yellow is the unweighting, okay? The red is actually the breaking, okay? Because at the, the bottom of the movement, okay, is where the, the lowest displacement, and then they start to reverse the force and then propel, which is the green, okay? And then the two smaller lines beneath the top lines are your left force and your right force. And in a healthy athlete, those two should, should track in a very similar pattern, okay? The, light, the lighter blue is the left, and then the dark purple is your right leg, okay? So here's a two-legged counter movement jump comparison. Um, and this is not meant to, to point out, uh, this is not any kind of political statement or anything like this. This is simply um, to give you a lay of the land as far as, you know, what numbers look like. Uh, when I first started testing, you know, I didn't really have any reference points. So I didn't really know, uh, you know, what's what, what's a good number, what's a bad number, what's an average number. You know, I've been able to collect a ton of data and I've started kind of generating some averages and things. Um, but to give you an idea of what the upper end of things look like, okay, uh, I have a, the male top performer is a uh, probably six foot five, 225 pound receiver who's freakish. And then the female top performer is one of the best hockey players, uh, female hockey players in the world. So two exceptional athletes, okay. So this is strictly meant to give you an idea, a reference point to start gauging what numbers should look like. Okay, so average propulsive velocity. Okay, that's the average velocity with which, at which the athlete's center of mass is moving during the upward phase of the movement. Your top male performer was a little over two meters per second. Your top female is 1.43, okay? Average propulsive force, okay? This is the average amount of force in Newtons being generated on the upward phase, okay? 2,700 uh, and, and 1,200, essentially. Uh, propulsive net impulse, okay, this is the twitchy, the, the springy uh, metric, okay, as you can see, that's a huge number, okay, for both of them, really, um, you know, 363 newtons times seconds, 188 um, for their, their gender, those are huge numbers. Uh, peak propulsive power, okay, so this is the peak amount of power produced during the propulsive phase, okay, you can see your numbers there. Your average braking velocity, meaning, you know, and I, you can see that those are negative numbers because it's really uh, you're losing velocity in the downward phase. Uh, you know, you're looking at somewhere the up the upper echelon for male athletes is somewhere around 1.01 .01, and for females somewhere around 0.8. OK, average braking force. Again, that's the average force in newtons produced during the braking phase of the jump. Uh, and again, these are two legged jumps. Breaking net impulse again, so you can kind of see, you know, the the net the breaking net impulse is usually always going to be lower than your propulsive net impulse. In your better athletes, you know, it, it creeps higher up as far as getting closer to the propulsive net impulse. Okay, uh, which you'll see down below in the impulse ratio numbers. Uh, jump momentum. That's how much momentum does the athlete have when their foot leaves the plate. I know Mike has talked about a really interesting concept, uh, you know, in, in kind of some passing discussion about uh, about using flying 10 numbers uh, to get uh, momentum numbers. Uh, so this is similar, but uh, without the horizontal component, this is strictly vertical, uh, and it's in kilograms per times meters per second. Uh, time to takeoff, meaning from the sec from the uh, the instant that they initiate the movement to when their foot leaves the plate. Okay, uh, the 0.69 number is really an obscene number given the amount of force that's produced there. Uh, and then you have your jump height numbers, okay? And those are in meters, all right? And again, keep in mind, those are hands on hips, not with hands. So they may not necessarily match up 
with what their vertical jump numbers look like. But remember, the upper, the upper body forces greatly enhance vertical jump numbers. Force at minimum displacement, okay, again, that's a Newton's and then impulse ratio. Uh, a lower number in the presence of a big propulsive net impulse is more desirable, although you'll see different uh, numbers with different profiles of athletes. Some athletes will have huge, you know, big high propulsive net impulse numbers, and they tend to be very fast, uh, linear uh, sprinters, um, but maybe their braking numbers are a little bit lower compared to others, and they may not be as agile, maybe, or as quite as good with, with change of direction, is my, my anecdotal observation. Okay, so case studies, okay, here's a 45-year-old female athlete with a history of, uh, she tore her ACL at a young age before she was done growing. Uh, so consequently, they were going to wait until her growth plates closed. So she waited a couple of years, I believe, uh, played some soccer, and then eventually had it done, okay? Uh, but keep in mind, this is probably, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, maybe, okay, 25 years ago. Um, but now these are single leg counter movement jumps, left versus right. So as you kind of go through your numbers, it's, it, it, it's a very clear picture of which leg is the involved leg. And keep in mind that this is somebody who trains uh, probably three times a week, is probably active five days a week, okay, and has been for a very, very long time. So a very well-trained subject. Okay, but your average propulsive numbers, you can see there's a 6.5% deficit. Okay, propulsive net impulse, 20% deficit. Propulsive force numbers, you know, a little closer. That's your slower speed uh, force production, but still a 7.5% deficit. Peak propulsive power, 15% deficit. Uh, average braking force, okay, a little lesser of a deficit. Average braking velocity, okay, the numbers actually look pretty good there. Braking net impulse, okay, your deficit starts to grow again a little bit. Uh, force at minimum displacement, similar. Time to takeoff is the same. Uh, jump height, okay, there's the big one, okay, a 36% deficit. And then jump momentum. Again, there's 20% less momentum at takeoff, okay, which kind of jives up with the other numbers, your propulsive force numbers and your power numbers. And there you see your impulse ratio, but that kind of speaks to the skew that you can see if you don't have a big net propulsive impulse number. Okay. So again, uh, this is a very real, um, you know, world kind of laser focused assessment of one leg versus the other when you're starting to consider things like, okay, how's she performing? And again, this is in the absence of any pain uh, or swelling or obvious dysfunction. Um, but, you know, if she was like, hey, can I play soccer? I'd be like, well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe I want to see these numbers get a little better. Okay. And you could also use it to tailor your training. Okay. And then here's how I reference it to the two legged counter movement jump. Okay. You will compare, okay, you can compare left to right average propulsive force. So on the two legged counter movement jump, okay, uh, she's favoring that left side by about 6%. Okay. Left to right average braking force favoring by about 10 and a half percent. And this is a two legged jump, mind you. Okay. Um, so you can see that these deficits carry over functionally. Okay. Uh, and generally, you know, the question is probably, um, you know, what's, what are, you know, I've, I've tested a number of, uh, uninjured subjects and generally, you know, they average somewhere from 0.1% to about a 3% difference from either way, uh, in a normal population, uh, within the single leg metrics, it's generally somewhere around a 5% variance either way. Okay, that seems to be what I find with normal athletes. Okay, what does this mean? There's propulsive and braking deficits. She's obviously favoring that left side with bilateral tasks. Okay, the original tear again was 30 so years ago. Okay, you know, some questions this for me gives rise to is how long do deficits last for? Okay, do they last forever? Okay, do they last for a year, two years? You know, my, I'm probably leaning towards they last a really long time, if not ever, okay? Uh, what dictates the lasting deficits? Is it graft choice? Is it osteoarthritis? Is it a meniscus injury? Is it the actual ACL surgery? Is this a fact of life? You know, uh, these are things that, you know, more data will answer, you know? And where would she be if she didn't train regularly? Uh, I think this one's a pretty easy one to answer in that those deficits would probably be double, 
okay? And she'd probably be getting ready for a knee replacement. Uh, because if you have those deficits, it only stands to reason that over time uh, that such substantial deficits, even in day-to-day -day life of hiking, going up and down stairs or whatever it might be, would lead to early onset uh, degenerative changes. I'd be willing to bet money on that, okay? And for her, you know, cutting and pivoting sports, probably not a great idea right now until these things improve, okay? What kind of interventions could you do? Um, you know, appropriate focus on improving propulsion and power. Uh, and again, these are just hypotheticals I'm throwing out there. Uh, you know, separate fo a separate focus on braking capabilities, okay? Improving, um, you know, neuromuscular capabilities. So, you know, plyos and landing tasks that focus specifically on landing phases, you know, maybe incorporate heavier eccentrics to try and help with those braking, with those braking capabilities. You know, maybe use blood flow restriction for hypertrophy if there's any, any uh, you know, atrophy that's lingering. So another example here is a right patellar tendon ACLR in a young uh, division one college female soccer player. Okay, she's about 13 months post-surgery here. Uh, division one woman soccer. Okay, expertly rehabbed by myself. Ha, <laughs> just kidding. Um, you know, so she's about 13 months out here. She's back participating, uh, not quite live action, but practicing, uh, participating in contact drills, uh, you know, almost back at full in scrimmaging, just about back at full force, really. Um, but as you can see, there's some, there's some lingering deficits, okay? Uh, on the two-legged counter movement jump, okay, you can see a left to right average propulsive force of 7.7% 7 .7 essentially. So they're leaning onto that left side more. Uh, and there's a side to side braking force uh, differential of 1.5%. So acceptable, uh, but still pertinent, okay? So here you see your. Uh, single leg numbers, okay, counter movement jumps. Um, your peak propulsive power numbers, okay, there's a 5% uh, difference, uh, or yeah, essentially a 5% difference. Average propulsive force, 4.7. 4 Average propulsive velocities, while I look at both numbers, they're good, uh, there's still an 11% difference from side to side, okay, which I'd wanna see a little lower probably. I don't think there's imminent disaster here, but again, it shows that these deficits can linger beyond your traditional year. I can only imagine what they would look like at the old six month number that was falsely spread about when to return uh, from ACL surgery. Uh, net propulsive impulse, again, you see a 6% differential, 5% differential for braking fo force, 8% for average braking velocity, 7.3 uh, for net braking impulse, uh, force at minimum displacement, 8%, uh, time to take off 5%. Here's the interesting one that I'm seeing with my patellar tendon graphs is you'll see a lingering jump height de de uh, discrepancy uh, that's more substantial, you know, 23% here, which in the, if that matched up with more substantial propulsive force and propulsive velocity deficits, I would be concerned. But in this case, I'm not, since those numbers look pretty good. Uh, your jump momentum, about 7.5%. Uh, and then your impulse ratios were pretty spot on from side to side. So all in all, she's safe to participate. But again, what I'd be curious to see is what do these numbers look like at two years post-op, okay? Um, you know, do the deficits still exist or do they resolve at some point here and the, number, and the lines kind of kind of merge? Here's another interesting case study, a meniscus repair, okay? 25-year-old uh, professional football linebacker, uh, very well-trained, years and years of lifting. Uh, he had a medial meniscus root repair. Um, in a particular knee, which I'll let you guess based on the numbers, I think it's pretty obvious. Uh, he's pain-free, he's asymptomatic, there's no swelling, there's no buckling, there's no locking, okay? There's no clinical symptoms. Uh, he's got a big two-legged counter movement jump, okay? Uh, half meter jump height, you know, 6,600 watts of peak power. So again, big numbers. Uh, and again, the, the surgery was probably three years ago, so it's sufficiently in the past. Um, but again, on your two-legged counter movement jump, okay, you're seeing a left to right breaking force discrepancy of 12%, which as an aside, you'll usually see deficits in the breaking force, uh, more so than the propulsive force. Okay, so he's favoring that left side by, by 
and then a much smaller discrepancy in the propulsive force. But now we look at his single leg numbers, and, and again, this is three years post-surgery, he's asymptomatic, but the discrepancies remain, okay? Uh, your peak propulsive power numbers, 12%, average propulsive force, 7%, propulsive velocity, a pretty substantial deficit of 13%, net impulse, propulsive net impulse, 8%, uh, average braking force, 8%, Okay, average braking velocity, 14%. Braking net impulse, 12%. Time to take off, 12%. Jump height, 16%. Okay, and so on. Okay, you can see the discrepancies are uniform. Okay, and this is what I mean by the data that these things collect is very accurate and precise. Um, so I look at these numbers, and yes, he has deficits. Um, but if you look at it in the context of referencing his numbers to averages, is he at injury risk? Maybe. Is it substantial? Uh, maybe not, because uh, when you look at his left single leg numbers in context with averages, they're still above average. Where they're below average is when you compare them to his right leg, if that makes sense. So it's not you know, disaster is imminent because he still has big numbers in the, in the big, big scheme of things. Okay. Um, but, uh, but when you compare side to side, there's some discrepancies there. And again, that leads me to the same questions of, okay, how long do these things last? Uh, does it ever return to symmetrical? You know, it, it really may not. Uh, you know, at what point are they quote unquote rehabbed? Uh, if we took specific interventions now, three, three years out, uh, would they affect these numbers or would they not affect these numbers? So, so questions to think about. Um, another one, we only have a few more slides here and then we'll get to some questions. Uh, a male college soccer player. This is a really interesting one that I found. Uh, somebody had left glass on the field. He went to slide tackle, had a big laceration and was non-weight bearing for a short period of time. I don't believe there was any tendon involvement with this. It was just a superficial, but he had needed a ton of stitches. Um, so was non-weight bearing for a little while, on crutches, stitches healed, scar looks nice. Is he ready to go? Uh, this is really fascinating. Okay, so there's your, your laceration. Okay, nice little scar. Okay, it's kind of right in the, the, the proximal portion of the Achilles where it gets broad and flat. Now, these are the traces, okay? If you look, so this is at the almost when their foot is about to leave the plate, when you would expect a last push from some forceful plantar flexion. I think it's pretty clear here which number is the, I mean, which trace is the involved side. The one on the left would be the uninvolved because you see an additional bump of force via forceful plantar flexion through the foot and ankle. Okay, versus the trace on the right, which was the lacerated side, okay, which you just see a drop off and then the foot leaves the plate. So again, outwardly, hey, this guy's ready to go. There wasn't really any musculoskeletal involvement, to be honest with you. But in reality, there's still deficits, okay? So is this guy at risk of re-injuring himself? Maybe, okay? But the point being is, is that this tool, the Hawkins force plates, were allowed me to pick up on these discrepancies versus just looking at it, watching them run, watching them move, and hey, he's good to go. Okay, post-op return, return to sports screening. Okay, uh, this is a whole topic for another discussion. Um, but, you know, in PT, you know, it's not very good, but it's something. Uh, you know, it shows that even rudimentary testing can help determine if an ACLR is at increased risk of re-injury. But in my mind, the bar is kind of low versus what we have been doing, for example, manual muscle testing. Um, you know, as a whole, as I mentioned, we kind of, we're kind of behind strength and conditioning, okay? The strength testing in our post-op return to sport is, is limited uh, to either isometric, isokinetic, uh, manual muscle testing. Uh, and uh, honestly, probably half people don't do anything. Um, there's no performance testing, okay? No fatigue resistance, no nothing. Hop testing is okay, um, but, you know, again, there's a lot of kind of static that you're going to get that will distort the data between the uh, influence of your upper extremities. And also there's a learned effect. You know, if they do this thing three or four times, they figure out how to do a triple hop, okay, and how to cheat it, okay? 
So there's no cheating on just a straight up single leg hop. And then the Y balance test, again, it's not really predictive of anything high velocity or high force. You know, the example I use with a lot of my, my soccer players, you know, if you were to look at workload data and GPS tracking of an average, you know, match in soccer, uh, a division one female athlete, okay, maybe who plays midfield where there's maybe a more ground to cover, uh, they will cover anywhere from eight to 12 miles in a match. Okay, that's eight to 12 miles, all right? Okay, so let's say they play two matches. That's at a low end, maybe 15 miles. And then we add on top of that uh, practices. And if you're covering that kind of mileage in that short of time, that means you're moving at a lot of velocity. Okay, so, okay, what does that hop testing look like when they're six miles in? Okay, meaning let's test their fitness levels. I mean, there's an idea, okay? So as an example, okay, here is a, an ACL uh, that was, uh, I, I forget exactly how far post-op they were, um, but they were isometrically tested, okay? Um, you can see that the, the right side was the involved side. So as you go through the picture on the left here, okay, um, you know, glute max evidently is substantially stronger on the involved side. Uh, hamstrings evidently are pathetically weaker on the un, on the involved side. That that really doesn't make sense to me. I'm sure they're weaker, but by that dramatic of a difference, I don't think so. Uh, especially in a patellar tendon graft. Uh, glute med strength, again, substantially stronger on that uh, right side. Okay, lots of monster walks with the bands around the ankles. Lots of sideline clamshells, uh, which I hate both of them. Um, you know, the quads evidently look even from side to side. Adductors, again, are stronger on the involved side. Uh, the notes, you know, need to increase hamstring strengthening, otherwise great. Okay. So, I mean, I'm going to preface this. First off, they couldn't jump on one leg. Okay. They couldn't jump on the involved side. Couldn't do a single leg jump. Okay. So I only got two-legged counter movement jump numbers. Okay. And here's what they look like. All right. So again, the key number that I look at right here, the two traces are the, the light blue, which is your left force, and your dark purple, which is your right force. And we're going to be wrapping up in just two minutes here, okay? You can see there's a huge discrepancy between the two, okay? Left to right comparison with the two-legged counter movement jump, breaking force 17.9%, and this is on a two-legged jump. So as you might imagine, they're going to be more sizable on a single leg jump, which we couldn't even do yet. Left to right average propulsive force, a 16% discrepancy. Okay, so really? Their quads are equal? Their glute max on their involved side is stronger? I don't think so. Okay. Granted, there's going to be a psychological component. Maybe they do favor that right side, but at the end of the day, the brain goes on the field or on the ice to compete with the body. So I don't care whether it's psychological or not. Okay. They need to have uh, confidence on that side and they need to be able to produce force and they need to be able to produce breaks. Okay. Really almost equal in strength. Okay. Hamstrings are 63% weaker. I, I think that's off as well. Looks great. Okay. They can't hop on one single leg. So again, that, you know, the strength testing in the, in the PT clinic is limited. Okay. You know, and then obviously gastroxoleus is a very important muscle group and function, but there's zero, uh, you know, uh, assessment of that. Not that you need to, but that's captured in your jump performance. Okay. So in summary, you know, force plates have gotten a lot cheaper and much easier to use. Razor sharp data that's extremely reproducible and actionable. Very useful as a strength and conditioning vital sign in real time. You can use it to make adjustments on the fly. Okay. In my, in my experience, it's the most precise means of assessing where an athlete or a client stands in their rehab process, and it gives very valuable insights that are not readily observable to the eye and very easy to use, literally one to two minutes or less. Okay. All right, John. Uh, thank you for that. I hope, hope it's useful. Let me figure out how to get back to my Zoom here. Well, uh, we got some questions here that we can run through uh, before we bring Cam up here. So uh, if you want me to just kind of read them off, you want to answer them? Sure. Sounds good to me. Um, so 
Lauren asked, um, how is the downward phase in a jump not an eccentric? Well, it, technically, okay, it can be an eccentric, okay, and it probably is functioning eccentrically, but you can't say with certainty uh, that every muscle at, at every point in the downward phase of that movement is functioning eccentrically. So it's really an issue of semantics in that, um, that it's really just terming it accurately. A more accurate term is, is that you're, I'm, I'm referencing what the athlete's center of mass is doing at that phase of the movement. And it's decelerating and it's applying force to decelerate the center of mass before it, in theory, stops for a millisecond and then it accelerates. So it's really a semantics issue in that it's, it's a more, more true way of referring to things. All right. Um, so I got another question here. It says, hi, John, what do you think about the fact that I found in an injured athlete during counter movement jump with two legs, a bimodal uh, in unimodal, uh, I can't actually understand what this question is. Leg with, um, Gabriel, maybe you could, uh, clarify your question in, uh, the, the Q and a, uh, in the next, next, uh, couple minutes here. Uh, Miguel asked, um, in a larger setting, would you be able to divide groups of athletes by priorities of intervention based on the data that you collect? Um, I can't speak from experience with this because I don't work in a team setting as much. Uh, I do know that a lot of the folks that I speak with, what they will do is they will run, they'll run the team. If they have a group of seven or eight, let's say, they'll just do a two, straight up two-legged counter movement jump, just one of them. And they'll run them through in about two minutes at the beginning and maybe briefly look at, you know, there's ways to configure your dashboard so that it shows peak power numbers relative uh, to past trials and they'll quickly look at those to see if people need a break essentially meaning uh, if you see a certain percentage or more of a decrement maybe you pull that guy out on a heavy day and maybe do more remedial work or more recovery based work uh, as far as you know splitting it up into three or four different groups i don't think uh, that that would be as practical no a uh, question about uh, graphs for ACL repairs. Based on the force plate data and your experience, what is the most successful graph to use uh, in your experience? Um, I like patellar tendon autograft, okay, which is a bone tendon bone graft. Uh, the biggest reason for me uh, among several is you have a bone to bone healing interface. So when they drill the bone, uh, bone tunnels in the femur and the tibia, you actually have the bone that's attached to the native patellar tendon healing to the bone tunnel, as opposed to say a hamstring graft where it's a soft tissue to bone healing interface, uh, which believe it or not, in some instances, you know, that, that tissue never actually interfaces with the bone in some cases, um, you know, and you'll, that bears out in failure rates. Uh, the failure rates of hamstring grafts are a little, little higher compared to patellar tendon over time. And also uh, when you strip a semitendinosus graft, you're rendering that semitendinosus useless. Uh, it will grow back in some capacity, but not in a way that is functional. Uh, and your hamstrings, if you think about how they wrap around your knee, they're a rotary stabilizer. Uh, how do you injure your ACL? Uh, rotational forces. So removing something that protects your knee from rotary forces to repair what you damage from rotary forces doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Uh, the one thing I would say um, that I need to, I actually need to speak with, a, with some surgeons more, is maybe down the road, uh, a bone tendon bone uh, allograft, uh, meaning from a cadaver, may be the gold standard. If it revascularizes and it turns uh, you know, into a viable tissue uh, and you don't remove that portion of the patellar tendon graft, uh, that may be the best um, you know, because you, what I am seeing is you'll see substantial deficits in jump height, single leg jump height in your patellar tendon grafts. Um, you know, whether they linger or not, I got to see, I got to get some people back on the plates a year, two years, three years out. Um, but that would be one thing that I'm seeing consistently is substantial deficits in jump height, not necessarily matching up propulsive powers numbers, but, but jump height. Um, so, you know, there's some surgeons who are actually taking the graph from the opposite knee now, 
uh, and it does speed the recovery because you're not recovering from two injuries on one knee. There's one on each, and they actually progress faster. So Gabrielli uh, clarified the question. So during a two-leg counter movement jump, they found that one leg, which was the chronically injured one, had a bimodal force time curve. And the other leg, the healthy one, had a unimodal first t- force time curve. Um, what do you think about this? Um, you know, it's hard to say. That could be a function. It, it depends on what kind of a lesion they have in their knee, perhaps, maybe, right? Uh, if it is their knee, you know, uh, is there an arthritic lesion where it becomes painful at one point in the range? So let's say consistently when they travel through, uh, let's say, I don't know, 45 degrees of knee flexion, you know, those spots come into contact and become painful. You'll definitely see a drop in force, I would suspect. Um, that might be a question that's more appropriate for Drake uh, Ber- Berbere. Uh, he's their sports scientist up there at Hawken uh, Dynamics. And I know I just butchered his last name, uh, but but he might be able to explain that a little better, but, but that would be something that, that maybe is, is dependent upon what the athlete is feeling. And I'd probably want to correlate that with other numbers, like how deep are they going in their counter movement depth? Uh, and what are their, what are their, imp- what's their impulse production look like? You know, you'll see deficits in other areas if it's bimodal and short. Uh, Sala said that they attended the Maitland course as well. And they were wondering how you integrate uh, manual therapy into your sessions. Um, you know, uh, the way I work things, and this is the beauty of working in the strength and conditioning setting is, is that, uh, you know, after I get a, a client going on home exercises that they need to do at home with consistency. And I, and I view it as a partnership. They need to do their part. I'm not sitting there to count reps. Okay. Uh, you know, and if they're working with a coach, um, my sessions after they're up and running kind of largely consist of, they come in and see me, I do some manual therapy with them. Um, which contrary to what you see on Instagram, manual therapy does work, um, you know, particularly in clients who are already exercising and deadlifting and, and moving, uh, and they still hurt magically, you know, deadlifting isn't the answer for everything. Um, you know, so I'll do some manual therapy. I'll review their home exercises. I'll adopt things or I'll adapt things as necessary. Uh, give them more or less leash as necessary. They start to reintegrate their activities. And then if there's any changes, I'll communicate with their coach whom they're working with. So uh, that's generally how I do it. I only see patients once a week, generally, unless it's very uncommon. Uh, And it's only for a half hour. I only, I I provide them with what they can't do on their own. So that's how I integrate it. Uh, Matthew asks, uh, do you have any other data to reference for power amounts, jump heights, et cetera, for athletes in different sports for ideal amounts? Or do you mainly look at right versus left? Um, that's what I'm in the midst of doing. Uh, I'm, I'm getting data points and I'm seeing lots of athletes. Um, I haven't had, I, I have some trends that I've identified that I'm not quite ready to share yet just cause I got to kind of put them all together. Um, but again, what you'll see is, is you'll see that, you know, that's why I provided that two legged counter movement jump, uh, slide at the beginning was to reference kind of what the high end looks like. And then you can work off of that. But, you know, I've gotten a number of like female soccer players, collegiate level, and I'm starting to see trends there. They kind of all hang around a certain number uh, as far as force production um, and power power output goes, uh, break force production, Um, you know, and you'll start to see some reference, some some trends between single leg numbers and double leg numbers as well. Um, You know, and then uh, coincidentally, I had... um, the Swiss bobsled coach, Chris Woolley, uh, is a really, really, really smart guy, and he produces some unbelievably powerful athletes. Um, you know, one of their female bobsledders, um, God, would produce 5,200 uh, watts of peak power output, which is by far the ho- highest number I've seen out of females. So uh, short answer is no, I don't have quite reference numbers yet, but I'm working on it. Uh, Hayden asked, uh, what was the counter movement depth of the male top performer? Um, I would probably say somewhere around 0.3 meters, 0.35 maybe, maybe 0.25, somewhere around there. I forget exactly. I'd have to look it up. Um, but as you might imagine, it's a fairly, with that, with that kind of a, a, a time to take off, a 0.7 seconds, it, it's not very deep. It might be less than that, actually. I'd have to look back and reference it, though. But if you're getting off the plates that quick, 
you're not making a deep jump um, drop and you're, you're really producing a ton of force in a short period of time. And the last one here from Leslie said, do you still assess an athlete with the single leg counter movement jump if they can't jump and stabilize upon landing on one leg? No, not yet. It's, it's, it's once they're ready to do it. I mean, I, I need, they need to be jumping on one leg in the clinic, you know, or out in the gym, they need to be doing hurdle hops, you know, and then I'll start collecting data. And, and I do it kind of at a time when it's safe, you know, and when they're ready for it. Uh, like I said, I'll start maybe with a two-legged squat even early on, and then eventually do a two-legged counter movement jump. And then once they've been doing some hopping and some bounding, then I'll start getting single leg numbers. Awesome. All right, John.